Hello and welcome to today's episode of A Cancer Conversation with the Georgia Cancer Center at the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta University. My name is Chris Curry and I am the host for this podcast series. I am the Communications and Marketing Manager here at the Georgia Cancer Center. Today we are joined by Dr. Renee Hilton Rowe to talk about the epidemic of obesity and its connection to cancer for women living in the United States. Dr. Hilton Rowe, thank you for joining me for today's conversation. Absolutely, Chris, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Well, we are glad to have you here. You are the director of the Center for Obesity and Metabolism here at Wellstar MCG Health and the Medical College of Georgia. And I know that this is an important topic for you to discuss and educate people about, so thank you for being here. Absolutely. So let's, uh, before we dive into the discussion about obesity, and its connection to cancer. We always like to sort of introduce our guests, give them a little bit of an opportunity to share their story. So talk to me about your decision to pursue a career in the medical field. Absolutely. So I grew up in a very small town in southwest Georgia, um, about 35 miles from our southwest campus in Albany, teeny tiny town called Edison, Georgia, no red light, just uh, around 1,000 people live there. Okay. So that I, is really small. <laughs> it's very small. <laughs> um, and uh, my family is a family of farmers. So we, um, my grandfather started a farm there, and um, my father, you know, continued in that tradition and also started a business doing land construction, building ponds, things like that. And uh, my mother was a nurse. So from an early age, I would remember going into the doctor's office with her if ever I was out of school or later when I started wanted, wanting to explore medicine. Um, I was allowed to shadow some of the physicians that she worked with, and it was in the tiniest little hospital you could ever imagine in a small town called Cuthbert, Georgia. I think there was one operating room, um, yeah, probably less than 30 beds in the entire hospital, Okay. um, but really rural medicine where you had a family medicine doctor, an ER doctor, and a surgeon, and they made the whole thing work. Um, And so that was kind of my first exposure to medicine is seeing how one physician could make a huge impact on an entire community. Mm -hmm. Um, People weren't having to travel hundreds of miles away from home to get care for basic, you know, cancer needs or surgical needs or routine medical problems. Uh, They could go right around the corner to their neighborhood physician hospital. Um, And to me, that made just a a really early impact um, on me and really led me to pursue medicine. Um, I think I knew I wanted to be a surgeon when I was probably 14 or 15 years old. Okay. So you figured it out in the teen years and you already <laughs> knew where you were headed. Yeah, I, I definitely, I, I knew that eventually my life goal would be to come home to Georgia and find a way to take care of my community um, in the same way that I'd seen these three men at the time do in Cuthbert. And um, again, I've, I've seen my mom, you know, take care of this community her entire career as a nurse. Um, and she probably had as much influence on my decision to go into medicine as any physician did, mm-hmm. just seeing really good bedside nursing and someone that put the patient above all else and just loved her career. And why surgery? There are a lot of different yeah. uh, options in the, mm-hmm. in the medical field. Why surgery? Um, it probably goes all the way back to that, that first hospital experience. I remember seeing this uh, true blue general surgeon go into one room and you know, do a C-section, go, there was no OBGYN care at that time mm-hmm. in the hospital, mm-hmm. go into the next room and, um, you know, did a colonoscopy the next room and took out an appendix, the next room, a gallbladder. And I just remember thinking, wow, like, is there anything that this man cannot do? Mm-hmm. Um, and so that I was fascinated by that. I also had the opportunity. I'm a, I'm a product of the Medical College of Georgia. I went to medical school here. And I did the majority of my third year rotations in Albany, Georgia. We didn't have a set campus at that time, but we had the opportunity to go down there. And I rotated at Phoebe um, and really saw just great hands-on general surgery and just was so impressed at the breadth of knowledge and just the way they were able to help a patient from head to toe if they, you know, if they wanted to. So um, I also love the feeling in an operating room. I, like I said, I grew up on that farm, right? Mm-hmm. I was fixing fences and, you know, doing everyday, you know, chores and things with my hands. And so I think I've always enjoyed aspects of medicine where I could do something and then see an immediate impact mm-hmm. on the patient. Mm-hmm. 
Um, surgeons are not very patient uh, in general, <laughs> so we, we like immediate results. Yeah. Um, I've been like that since I was probably a toddler. Okay. Um, so that's one of the things that I loved about it, too, is you could see a patient come in after a car crash or a patient with appendicitis, and they were so sick. Um, you go to the operating room, and they come out, and they look better, mm -hmm. and you fix them. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed that immediate satisfaction of helping a patient. I also liked the relationships that in certain fields of surgery you're able to form with your patients because it's not just a one operation and you're done. You have the ability to follow these patients for years after. Cancer mm -hmm. care is certainly like that. Yeah. Um, and what I do now um, with metabolic and bariatric surgery is certainly like that. I follow my patients for five years after surgery. I know them. I know their families. I see them in the grocery stores around town. Yeah. And, you know, they run up excited to hug me and say, hey, they show me their recent Instagram pictures of how amazing they look and the cool things they've been able to recently do. So Augusta was a small enough town to give me that hometown community feel that yeah. I was looking for. Yeah. Yet we have a major medical center with every opportunity that I could ask for, for research, collaboration, um, state of the art care for my patients. So that's ultimately, I think, what led me back to Augusta. Um, I left here after medical school, went to the University of Miami, uh, Jacks Memorial Hospital for residency, and then did a fellowship at Yale University in minimally invasive and bariatric surgery. Okay. Um, and then um, one of my mentors from med school called me and told me there was a spot open here, and um, the rest is history. I came down as fast as I could, I think. <laughs> well, we're glad that you uh, that you came. Um, talk about the decision to, to sort of specialize in that bariatric surgery area. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of people have asked me that in my career because they're like, you know, why did you choose weight loss surgery? And I always stop them and say, so it's not weight loss surgery. It's metabolic surgery. And the reason I say that is I love seeing how amazing my patients look. And we take patients that come in and they're so dissatisfied with their body image. And on the other side of surgery, they look amazing. But that is not why I chose this field. That is not why I do this field. I love taking patients who are very sick with metabolic syndrome. So they have things like diabetes, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, all of these metabolic syndromes that can really lead to stroke, heart attack, cancer, really other bad medical problems. And sur the surgery gets rid of this. Um, it literally, through metabolic surgery, we're able to put all of these disease into remission, if not completely cure them. Mm -hmm. And for me, again, I think this goes back to those South Georgia roots and seeing really good. Sometimes I, I think I've heard it said the really best medicine is preventative medicine. Yes. And I that's, that. that's what I'm offering. I'm offering patients an opportunity to prevent themselves from ever getting sicker um, with, you know, macrovascular disease such as heart, heart disease, stroke, um, some of the other long-term um, end results of these metabolic diseases. So what I tell patients is, yes, while I love how you're going to look and how you're going to feel because they are going to feel a lot better, the reason I did this is because I would rather prevent someone from needing a heart operation down the road than actually doing the heart operation. Yeah. I think there's a lot of power in preventative health care. Yeah. Um, you talked a, a little bit ago about having these patients come up to you and hug you and show you their Instagram mm -hmm. in the grocery store or, or just out shopping in general. What does that mean to you? That's everything. Um, I try not to get teary eyed when we talk about stuff like this, but that's I think if you if you don't get goosebumps and you don't get a little teary eyed as a physician when things like that happen, I don't know really what you're doing in this field because that's the reason all of us go into medicine, right? Is you want to make an impact. Mm -hmm. um, that's the best part, you know. Sometimes the days get long and you, you know you're chugging through the electronic medical record and writing a thousand notes, and then you end up at you know Publix and someone walks up to you and hugs your neck and is like, "You made a profound difference in my life." Um, check out, you know, this is me. I just graduated from college. We've had patients go back to school. Um, oh, wow. This is so much more than just about their body. It gives them confidence, um, kind of a new start, a fresh start, maybe the courage to go back and pursue something that they otherwise wouldn't do. And one of the most impactful patients um, in my career was one of my first patients I treated here. And she went back to school. She had dropped out of high school. She went back, got her GED, and then ultimately went and got a college degree. Um, and so that to me is everything, right? Like that's why we yeah. do this is you want to make an impact on patients. You want to make a difference. Um, and I think that sometimes that is the best part of my job 
is hearing from these patients who otherwise might not have had the courage to do something um, and that you, you just know that you, you help them accomplish that. It's, it's not the surgeon. I gave them the tool to do it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it has to be a dedicated, motivated patient. But when you work together with a patient in a team setting like ours is, um, it's really exciting to see that end result. Now, do you bring in any sort of um, psychosocial sort of care? We talk a lot about that at the Cancer Center because mm-hmm. we have a psychosocial oncology program. But I imagine that you're not just doing the surgery to prevent the, the, the problems, the health problems. Mm-hmm. There's also some, some attitude and behavior change. You talk about that confidence and that courage to you know, get your GED, go back to college, and, and the other things that patients have done. What about the, the psychosocial sort of aspect of that can you talk about? Yeah, that's a very important part of this process. And um, just to talk a little bit maybe about the process and whole to kind of explain to people how it works. Um, you don't just walk in one day and say, I want metabolic surgery. That's, that's not how it works. Mm-hmm. We have an entire program, a care team, um, and really practice what we think is great patient-centric care. So when they come in for that initial evaluation, it's not just the surgeon that they're meeting. We have a psychologist who specializes in bariatric and metabolic surgery. Um, We have registered dietitians. And the psychosocial part of this is hugely important. Um, We have to talk about, you know, what led to this? Why, Why have you gained weight? Let's talk about disordered eating. Some of our patients binge eat, and a lot of times it's not even because they're hungry. It's because they're bored or they, again, this is a disease like everything else. They have never sat down and talked to someone about, you know, why is it at nighttime when I'm bored, I'll get up out of bed, go to the pantry and consume 5,000 calories. There are reasons that that happens. And we have trained psychologists that specialize in this that can really help a patient talk through those triggers, identify what's kind of setting off that mental behavior and then try to block it, try to come up with healthy alternatives. All of our patients go through um, psychiatric clearance where they we make sure we, we say mind, body, and soul. Um, okay. The body can be ready, but mind, soul, everything has to be there. You have to be yeah. fully committed, ready to make the change. Um, and then we also have to make sure that you're mentally in a good place, that you're going to be able to do this because it, it is a lifestyle change. It's not just for one day or even the three to six months before surgery. If you go back to old behaviors after surgery, we know that it's not as successful. Mm-hmm. And that's where having a trained psychologist um, can really, really help us with that. And all of our patients, every single patient is required to visit with a, with our bariatric and metabolic psychologist before surgery. Okay. Now, one of the things that we were talking about right before we started recording was the number of, of cancers. And that's really what we're going to talk about is obesity mm-hmm. and its connection to cancer for females. But talk mm-hmm. about why people are showing up with cancer when they are preparing for metabolic surgery. Right. So a lot of cancers are hormonally driven. So we know that estrogen, testosterone, all of these things are these are great hormones in our body. They have a, a purpose. But when you have really, really high levels of estrogen, those um, high levels can actually contribute to some forms of female cancer, specifically endometrial or uterine cancer is the biggest one that we talk about. It also factors into breast cancer. Um, There are more than 14 different types of cancer where they have found links between obesity, leading to not only increased risk of developing those cancers, but worse outcomes if you get that cancer and you have obesity. So when we look at the downstream effect of metabolic surgery, not only can it prevent these cancers from occurring, particularly in women, but also if a woman does end up developing these cancers, if they've had metabolic surgery, their chance of survival ends up being better. We saw some of the same results with COVID-19 as well. Um, Obesity creates a pro-inflammatory response in the body. And with inflammation, whether it be from, you know, cancer or infectious diseases like COVID, too much inflammation is a bad thing. Again, everything serves a purpose in the body, but if you're always in an inflammatory state, um, that is what can really drive these other processes that end up not being good for us. Mm Um, But with endometrial cancer specifically, it's really high levels of estrogen um, that leads to this. And when you look at huge meta-analysis studies where they compare hundreds of thousands of women 
Metabolic and bariatric surgery is protective against endometrial cancer. Not only can it prevent it from ever occurring, but there are some small studies now showing that you can actually treat stage one endometrial cancer with metabolic surgery and um, an IUD. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So we've, we've had cancer completely regress after mm-hmm. bariatric surgery and hormonal um, medication. Now, Dr. Hilton Rowe, I know that you recently launched this Women's Health Initiative. I want you to talk more about that for those mm-hmm. that are, are watching or listening to this podcast. What is it? So um, this is probably one of my most passionate projects. Um, it's not only we're doing research in this area, um, but it's a wonderful clinical opportunity for patients in the CSRA. Um, so the Women's Health Initiative was an idea that Dr. Chad Burn Ray and I had um, probably now five four or five years ago, maybe 2017 and 18. Um, And we really started planning out what would it look like if a woman could walk into an office and literally receive all of her care head to foot for screening as it pertains to women's health and her obesity. Because we know that in bariatric and metabolic surgery, around 80% of our patients are women. And the majority of those women are of childbearing age or perimenopausal. So we knew that we had a large number of female patients that would come in and benefit from this. Um, So we launched the Women's Health Initiative. Dr. Hamer Titus is the OBGYN who partners with me to do this. And what it means is that every single woman who walks into the bariatric and metabolic program Um, is given the opportunity to be evaluated and see a trained OBGYN. And the reason that we found this so important, kind of what what spurred uh, this conversation with me and Dr. Ray, is we had so many women that were not getting routine screening that we knew would save their life. Things like pap smears, endometrial biopsy if they have abnormal uterine bleeding, mammograms, colonoscopy, just having family planning, being able to sit down and talk to someone about birth control. If you weren't ready to have another child, what are your options? Um, We also recognize that in this patient population, there's a lot of sensitivity um, about your size and your body. Uh, Sometimes I see patients that when they come in to see me in the metabolic clinic, um, they'll say, Dr. Hilton, I haven't, I haven't seen a doctor in 20 years. And I'm like, why, why? And it's because they're embarrassed. Like I, I really, I, every time I go see a doctor, they lecture me about my weight. Mm-hmm. They tell me I need to lose weight. I know that it's hard. I think every single person just about on this campus, if you asked them today, would you like to lose some weight? We'd all say yes. <laughs> the reality yes. is, yes, <laughs> yes. I agree. everyone, right? Myself yes. included. But the reality is it's hard to lose weight. Mm-hmm. So put yourself in this woman's shoes. If you've been going to the same you know, provider And every time you go in, they say something about your weight. Um, They make you feel guilty or you're told we can't do a pap smear on you today because you're too big for our table. Mm -hmm. I've had stories like that before, too, where the patient was too big. Either they couldn't, you know, perform the procedure or they had difficulty doing it. And it, it led to shame. And so you have patients who decide not to go back because they're that embarrassed. So I was seeing patients on this end of the spectrum that had not seen a primary provider in years because of this embarrassment. And then Dr. Ray and Dr. Titus were seeing patients on the other end of the spectrum that were really great about staying up with their health care, but they had obesity and they were struggling to lose weight and they wanted to lose weight or they were developing early signs of endometrial cancer. Um, And so we said, what if we could treat them all in one place? And that's what the Women's Health Initiative is all about. Every woman who comes in, we ask her all of the, the screening questions Uh, for age-appropriate screening. So are you up to date on your mammogram? Have you had your colonoscopy? We go through a very detailed women's health history to see if they're having um, problems with their menstrual cycles or they have an abnormal bleeding. Abnormal heavy vaginal bleeding is the hallmark, probably one of the first earliest signs that you could have endometrial cancer um, as a woman. And sometimes women just We'll go on for months thinking this is normal or, you know, it's just my period's a little heavy. In actuality, that could be a really big warning sign that something's wrong. So we screened them. And then even if nothing is off, even if they have all of these things up to date, we ask them, would you like to meet with a women's health expert um, and talk about family planning? Uh, Because many of our women want to go on to have children. Um, Or if they don't want children, we talk about the other aspect of that, which is birth control. Um, If you want to see someone, we arrange it for them. And when they come in for one of their follow-up visits as part of the metabolic program, 
Dr. Titus is in our clinic. She sees them as a, again, she's trained OBGYN that works here. She sees them, provides them all the best up-to-date care. If they do have a risk of cancer, we do the procedures right there in clinic. They get an endometrial biopsy. They get a pelvic exam. Um, We schedule them for mammography or colonoscopy if they need it. Mm -hmm. And what we've been able to do with this initiative is really why I think we're being asked to talk about it nationally, uh, present our research, publish papers, and that's we're identifying cancer earlier in women who otherwise may not be going in to get worked up for cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, We even recently identified endometrial hyperplasia, which is a precursor to cancer in a 17-year-old, which is, to our knowledge, probably the youngest age um, reported in the literature. Wow. So it's not just older women. These are young women. We've seen 25-year-olds with endometrial cancer, full-blown stage 2 cancer. So it's it's really exciting because it's this is not the norm in bariatric programs. This was a novel idea that we've created here. We've now been doing it um, for, I want to think this is our third year. I think it started in 2019. So we are actually in the process right now of collecting and publishing our three-year data. Oh, wow. So we've, we've already given keynote addresses at several regional local conferences and even spoken nationally about this initiative. So my goal would be to make this reproducible in other bariatric programs around the country mm-hmm. and hopefully use our, you know, Wellstar MCG model here as something that other programs could copy and paste and provide this life-saving benefit to women all around the country. Um, so hopefully I'll be speaking at a big... Um, on a much larger stage next year okay. um, to even get this further, you know, further out there nationally and to present this data. Can I ask you about being a woman working in a surgical field where 80% of your patients are females? Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's a wonderful field as a, as a female to practice in because again, so many of my patients are female and I do feel like I can relate to them. Um, I'm a mom. I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old. I certainly, you know, put on baby weight Mm -hmm. during pregnancy. It's hard to get that weight off. Mm -hmm. It's also, I think, a challenge when you are a busy working mom to leave work at five o'clock, fly to school or daycare or wherever, pick up your kids, get home a little after six, and then put this gourmet bariatric approved healthy meal on the table right yeah. like it's so much easier to go through a fast food drive through on the way home and do that some days and I'm guilty of doing that I do that I'm the first to admit we have you know Chick-fil-A Friday every but again things in moderation are okay yeah one of the things that I think makes our program also unique and maybe perhaps even makes me unique as a surgeon is I can relate to those patients when they're like Dr. Hilton I'm a mom like I've got three kids I've got to pick them all up I've got to get them fed that's when I'll start giving them my mom tips. Well, have you tried going to Costco and getting a, you know, the, this and, and, and big supply? And then you can, you know, we talk about making things easier for the patient. If all of us had the time and the resources to have a private chef that could cook us a, you know, five-star healthy breakfast, lunch, and dinner, then we may not, you know, we, we'd all be doing better. But the reality is that's not the reality for most of us and certainly not for my patients. So I think it has given me a lot of empathy um, understanding where my women are coming from. Um, and I do think sometimes it might even be easier for our female patients to open up and talk to a female provider mm-hmm. about some of these really personal, you know, female problems that they're having. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, I have, um, I have two partners that work with me in the Center for BC Metabolism. Um, one is a man, and he is the greatest champion for women that I have ever met in my life, Dr. Aaron Bulldock. And my junior most partner, Dr. Janie McKenzie, just joined us from Vanderbilt University. Um, so we have a great team who I feel like every one of us, you know, meets the needs of these women. And um, we invite all women to come down and, and check out the program and see what we have to offer. It's interesting, though, because you talk about being a woman in surgery. And for most of my career, I sometimes would struggle with, you know, if a man walked in with a hernia, maybe they didn't want the female provider because, again, this is a private issue on a man. And yeah. I encourage all patients, it doesn't matter, man or woman, like just go to a provider who's going to take the best care of you. Yeah. That's always my disclosure. Yeah. Don't care what your provider looks like, what they are, just go to the best provider who's going to, you know, work with you and take the best care of you. Um, but it, it kind of was amazing when I found this career with all of these female patients who, again, 
I totally can identify with a busy mom with multiple kids who's put on a little bit of weight every year, a little bit of weight after pregnancy, and is struggling just to kind of make everything, all the ends meet at the end of the day, because it is, it is hard. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about the kinds of conversations you're having with women you see before surgery as well as after the procedure, because we talk about the team, but what are those conversations like beforehand? And then what Mm -hmm. are they like afterwards? Because before you're doing, you know, you're working on the behavior modification and you're Mm -hmm. talking with this, you know, the psychosocial teams and whatnot, Mm -hmm. but then what are those conversations like on the other side? Because Mm -hmm. you do all this prep work, you go through the surgery, but those patients Mm -hmm. still have to keep up with the program. And you talk about being a busy mom with Mm -hmm. kids and Mm -hmm. after school activities and all that. What are those conversations like on the other side? Absolutely. So I think probably the most important conversation that I have with patients at that initial consultation is what do you want to get out of this? What's your goal? Because my goal as their provider may be very different than what their goal is. And we don't just identify a weight goal, like what do you want to weigh? I ask them for what we call non-scale victories. And you'll see it all over our social media, hashtag NSV, non-scale victory. So what does that mean? Well, what is something you really want to do that you can't do right now because of your weight? I hear all the time, I want to go to Disney World with my kids. I'm too big to ride the rides and it's embarrassing. Um, Maybe I want to fly on a plane without a seatbelt extender. I get, I want to run a 5K. Um, And it's really helpful to have what I call SMART goals, like goals that are measurable that we can actually set together. And we talk about these goals on that very first visit. And I put them in the note because I think that's a vital part of the medical record, same as their initial weight. Because what I love showing patients when they come in for that aftercare is, and for after surgery, when they meet that goal, we celebrate it. Okay. Um, And another reason we do that is because if you set a goal to say, you know what, I want to weigh 180 pounds a year from now. And if you come in a year from now and you weigh 181 pounds, the last thing I ever want you to feel is, man, I didn't reach my goal. Yeah, but you weigh 181 pounds. You look amazing. You feel amazing. You're running 5Ks. Um, You're flying without a seatbelt extender. You just took your whole family to Disney World. You're graduating from college. So we really want to celebrate that it's not about all about weight loss. Mm -hmm. Other things that I hear a lot is I'm a diabetic and I'm sick of insulin. I don't want to stick myself or I'm, I have hypertension. I'm on three meds. I don't want to take medications. So we set very realistic goals. Okay. Do you want to be off all of them? Would you be okay with maybe one maintenance medication? What is your ultimate goal? Mm -hmm. We set all of that pre-op knowing that after surgery, when they come back in, it's a continuous process. So when we do surgery, we see them back at two weeks post-op to make sure that everything went well look at their incisions, make sure they're healing, they're back on track. We let them go back to work. We go ahead and start them back on solid foods. Everyone always thinks they're going to be on liquid diets forever after bariatric surgery. That's not true. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we see them back at six weeks. That's for another dietary advancement. Six weeks after surgery, they're back on regular food, like food just like they were pre-op. They come in at three months, six months, and 12 months. And I tell all of my patients, this part of the program, I would argue, is as important, if not more important, than the pre-op. And the reason for that is here's the accountability, where you're going to come back in. Yes, we're going to put you on a scale, and we're going to weigh you. We're going to check all of your labs. This is a metabolic surgery, so if you don't take um, vitamins, uh, you can develop some deficiencies. This is We're talking about one vitamin a day. We actually have it for them downstairs in our center. They can pick it up on the way out at the pharmacy. Um, But we want to check those labs because if you're rapidly losing weight, we have to make sure you don't need extra vitamin D or folic acid or B12. And if we see that any of those levels are off at those follow-up visits, we increase the vitamins or give you just that one vitamin you need extra of. But the most important part of this, I think, is just the support. The fact that we want to bring this patient back in and celebrate how well they're doing with them. That's what we get the most excited about. That's when we're all standing out in the halls and taking, you know, selfies that we're going to put on Instagram later um, or the patient's going to share on their feed later where they're also talking about the fact that, you know, I've had patients come in that were on 170 units of insulin pre-op and post-operatively they're off everything. And these changes happen very fast. We send patients home from the hospital off insulin. 
We send them home off of their blood pressure meds. Some of these changes are immediate after surgery. Others take a little bit of time to lose some weight. Um, but there's, to me, there's nothing better than when we see a patient six months after surgery and they're already, you know, have lost 60 or 80% of their weight. They're off all of these medications. We check their labs. Their labs are good. We start talking about what other goals can we set now? Maybe they've already met all of those first goals. Well, your goal is no longer to run a 5K. Now let's start talking about a half marathon or a marathon or an Ironman. Um, you know, they're, they're bringing in their workouts and showing us what they're bench pressing, you know, at the gym. Oh, wow. Um, and then for some of these women, particularly where we are identifying cancer or the risk of cancer, it's continued surveillance. Is it time for you to see Dr. Titus again for your one year follow up to do another biopsy if we need to? Um, we really make sure that we follow them, that we track them and we keep up with all of that for them. We know everyone's busy. We're, we're going to tell you, Hey, guess what? It's time for you to come in and get your labs. Mm-hmm. Um, or it's time for you to see Dr. Titus again, or guess what? Mammograms up again. They get reminders, text and emails. Um, so I think the follow up is hugely important just to make sure the patient's on track. Um, and if they're not on track, we have options. So many times I hear patients that are like, man, I lost great weight after bariatric surgery, but then life happened. You know, maybe I got depressed over something that happened or I celebrated something else that happened. I've gained a little bit of weight back. We have amazing medications to offer these days, even for patients who have had surgery. We also run a medical weight loss clinic as part of the Center for Obesity and Metabolism. So not everything is about surgery. If surgery is not the right fit for you, we have medical options. Um, And I think adding medications to some of our post-operative patients' um, weight plan is the right thing to do. If they've started to kind of slide back into some of the old routines, we have a back-on-track program where they get the counseling again that they need, the registered dietitian support, and then medicine sometimes is the best thing to also add into that. So Dr. Hilton Rowe, I have this question for you. People who may be watching, listening to this podcast, they've thought about bariatric metabolic surgery, but they're not sure because there's a lot of different conversations in, in our culture about bariatric metabolic surgery. What advice would you give them? How can they get in touch with you? What do they need to do? That's a great question, Chris. Thank you. Um, so I think the most important thing that I really want to get across, um, to the audience, to anyone who might be watching is if you've thought about this, come in and see me for a consultation. You're not committed to anything. You can go on our website. Um, there are phone numbers that you can call. There are links that you can click on all throughout our website. You'll see things that say, start your journey. Now click on that, put in your information and let one of the team members reach out to you. I hear this all the time where people are very unhappy with their weight. Um, they're worried about their health risk. They're worried about diabetes. They're worried about high blood pressure or the risk of cancer, but they're really scared to take that next step and talk about surgery because they've seen or heard where it might be really dangerous or someone didn't have success with it. And what I'll tell you is those are the minority of cases. Bariatric metabolic surgery is incredibly safe. It's actually safer than getting your gallbladder out, Chris. Really? A lot of people don't know that. I don't know. I've had my gallbladder out, actually. (laughs) It is safer than that. The morbidity and mortality associated with metabolic surgery is safer than a gallbladder. It's safer than a joint replacement. It's a very safe operation if you're doing it at a center of excellence, at a MISQIP accredited center, which ours is. Um, that's, that's really the key is even if you're not coming to our center, go online, do your research, make sure you're going to board certified, um, surgeons, MISQIP accredited centers. We're all held to a very high safety standard, but most importantly, if you've thought about doing this, reach out, come in for a consultation. There's no commitment and just meet us, meet our team, see if you qualify. It's a safe option. It's a very good option. It's not all about weight. This is about preventative medicine um, or preventative surgery at its best. So um, just come in and uh, and see if you're a good candidate for it. Come talk to our team. I really like how you say that, that it's, it's not about weight loss. It's Mm-mm. about preventing other problems. Yes, or curing the ones you already have. Yeah. So I joke with my team that I, I want to put up a billboard um, going up Walton Way or on I-20 that says, you know, if I had a magic pill that would cure hypertension, diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, fatty liver disease, prevent uterine cancer, 
improve erectile dysfunction and sexual performance in men. This isn't all about the ladies. Yeah. We do a lot of really cool stuff for men too. Yeah. Would you take a pill for that? And if you answered yes to any of those questions, come see if surgery is right for you. You don't have to take a pill for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. This is a one-time operation. Um, it's a total lifestyle health improvement. The operation itself takes one to two hours. Typically, our patients spend one night in the hospital and go home the next day. It's um, so a very, very safe operation. You're getting the benefit of having a full team that's completely committed, not just to your weight loss journey, but your metabolic health and prevention of all these future diseases. So I... Again, I can't, I can't figure out sometimes why more people don't come use it. Only one to one and a half percent of the United States population that is eligible for bariatric surgery will come in and actually investigate it. Oh, wow. And I think part of the reason is we have TV shows like 600 Pound Life. Um, and so a lot of people think, oh, I'm not, I'm not big enough. This doesn't pertain to me. But in actuality, if you're five foot two as a female and weigh 190 pounds and have hypertension or diabetes, you would qualify. So we're not talking about weighing 600 pounds. I'm talking about being in the 200s as a female of average height um, and having a medical problem. Um, and again, these are my favorite patients to get in through, through the door because I just I love the preventative aspect of this so much. Um, let us prevent you from ever developing these diseases because, yeah. again, the best medicine is preventative medicine yeah. in my book. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dr. Hilton Rowe, I appreciate your time today. I appreciate you sitting down to talk to us and, and educate us. Uh, our viewers, me, uh, about this topic. So thank you very much and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Chris. Now, remember that you can find a cancer conversation on YouTube. We have a video version. We have a video version on Spotify. You can also find us on Apple, Google, and Amazon Music um, or just about anywhere else that you might listen to your uh, podcast series at and remember that you can uh, submit questions we'll give you some of the links that dr hilton Rowe talked about in the description uh, send us an email if you have questions cancer at augusta.edu uh, we monitor that email address every day and um, enjoy the rest of your day and thanks for watching